today, uh, there are some uh, questions that we need to ask ourselves or any religious group in which we <coughs> we become a part of or <coughs> excuse me or or uh, intend to become a part of, and we need to ask these questions about the group: Is does it stress man-made rules or taboo? or uh, these man-made guidelines rather than God's grace? Otherwise, does man's traditions and man's rules place above the authority of Scripture or what God says concerning his grace? The, word, the road to heaven does not run through our yard, nor does it run through the yard of any certain denomination or group. God, uh, that is the wonderful thing about the liberty and the freedom of God is we can approach God through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and none of us have a patent on that. The gospel of Jesus Christ gives us that patent or that freedom as if we call upon the name of the Lord, we shall be saved. I don't have to go to another man. I can call upon the name of the Lord wherever I am. Jesus furnished that for me. And he furnished that for you. And there is liberty in that. There's freedom in that. There is a direct line between God the Father and the worshiper through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and no one else. Does it foster a critical spirit toward or does it exercise discipline discreetly and lovingly? Otherwise, does it intimidate people to keep people in line or does it handle people gently and with the love of God? You know, we we have seen a lot of abuse with certain cults. You know, I'm sure you remember the Jim Jones story about how they were abused and how they were controlled, even to the point of where there was a mass suicide. We uh, don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But there's things to look out for. You know, the, is the Bible the ultimate authority? And does the spiritual leaders also come underneath the authority of Scripture, uh, does it stress a formula or special knowledge or secret knowledge or a special vision more than the Word of God? And we've seen a lot of these. I mean, you can uh, you got these extra books that people will envision that they claim that's some special revelation. Uh, but we need to ask these tough questions. Does it neglect? Christ, universal church, or the worldwide church, or it does it claim that it is a elite special group? And I've seen some of these, you know, you know, everybody's going to hell but us. We're the only ones doing it right. Have you ever seen that attitude out there in the world with with certain small groups? I mean, they, uh, they, that attitude is alive and well in the day in which we live. Does it regard the family? Uh, rather than holding it in high regard as the Bible does, does it actually lift the family up, the family values, the family model that the Bible basically puts forth, does it put that forth also? Otherwise, does it express the heart and the values of God pertaining to the family? And if these groups, any of these groups, fail these tests and I would suggest for you to run to, to separate yourself from them and of course we also have the doctrinal issues of the deity of Christ the authority of scripture and the pure unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ which puts forth the death burial and resurrection of our Savior and that Jesus died for our sins and we are complete in Christ and I can't express to you enough uh, as to the completeness and the wholeness of the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. You know, our salvation is in him and him alone. And I don't need to make myself a part of your group to be uh, a child of God. God done that, did that work completely for me. But <clears throat> having said that, the book of Hebrews tells us that not to forsake our, uh, our assembling of ourselves together more so in, is as we see the day approaching because the uh, there is safety in numbers. There's safety in a group. You'll notice that the wolf 
wants to separate a sheep or a weak person from the fold. And in doing so, they can take advantage of the situation. And we'll talk some more about that as we go forward as to how the enemy operates, as how he takes people that are disgruntled and unsatisfied, and he uses them, he preys upon them. And not only does he use them to, to conquer them and to deceive them, but he can also use them as instruments to affect other people. But Spurgeon tells us that this would be the first step in apostasy is for his men to forget the truth and then adore that which is false. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 15, he, you know, he had to contend with a lot of the Judaizers, which was another form of apostasy or another form of false doctrine. For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed in as ministers of righteousness, whose ends shall be according to their flesh. And th we see this pattern over and over again in the book of Jude as to them that do not have the right motive or are not in the, uh, the, the right uh, relationship with God going forth and, and operating under selfish means or in a deceitful way, that there is judgment that will come. And this is going to increase as we go into the latter days. The Bible speaks of a great falling away in Second Thessalonians. And that falling away is the same word, apostasy. There's going to be a great apostasy of the latter days that's going to take place as for, far as people having whatever ideology they may have, but they have turned away from the truth and gone after some form of uh, other religion or uh, some form of other counterfeit uh, that the enemy has put forth out there. And remember, he presents himself as an angel of light. But the book of Jude tells us that, yes, they may do these things, but they're just as in time past where judgment came upon them that uh, rebelled and them that fell away or them that, that but went against God. There's judgment coming uh, for these also. The future predicts that God's fiery judgment on apostasy and reminds his readers. And, and this is the last example as we conclude or come into the conclusion of the book of Jude. He, uh, he mentions Enoch. Enoch, <coughs> and it was about these that Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied, saying, The Lord came with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all to convict all of the ungodly of all their uh, deeds of ungodliness, and they have committed in such uh, an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And the him of the context of the latter part there is the Lord uh, of verse 14. There's a lot to unpack in these, uh, these two verses. One is Enoch. Enoch is not a canonized scripture. It comes out of the book of Enoch. Enoch went MIA for many, many, many years. They discovered a copy of it in Ethiopia in 1812, 21. Uh, they uh, translated it over into, en into English. This was a familiar text that was being circulated around with the first century church, though. But uh, if you know your history, there was a lot of fires and there was a lot of wars. The School of Alexandria, the big library at Alexandria where they kept a lot of records, that, that was destroyed. There was a lot of books that got destroyed. They tried to replace some of those from memory. And some of them, they was copies in various places, but because they were not watched over with a strict code, and this was some of the standards as far as canonizing scripture that Enoch fell out of, they, uh, they found a copy in 1821 in Ethiopia. But uh, one thing to credit Enoch, they also found copies in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is, goes back much farther 
and was found much later, though, in not a 10-year research of Dead Sea Scrolls from 1946 to 1956. The thing I'm trying to get up uh, over to you, the book of Enoch is mentioned in the book of Jude. Jude held it as a sacred text, but we're not 100% sure that the text we hold today is the same one that Jude had. So therefore, it, it doesn't pass the test of being... Uh, able to canonize it. I believe it has some historical value. I, I, I wouldn't take my theology from it. It could, be ta could have been tampered with by the Gnostics. That's just my opinion, though. But it concerns the judgment and the apostates of uh, the fallen angels. It also proclaims the judgment that's going to be coming. And this is a real stretch here because Enoch is the seventh generation from Adam. That was pre-flood. This was pre-flood text here. Enoch, walk with God, was not for God took him. He's the seventh generation from Adam. And that's pointed out to us because there was another Enoch back there too, which was the third generation, which was the son of Cain. This ain't him. <laughs> this Enoch is the seventh generation through the genealogy of Seth. And it says we have very little uh, record of him. It says he was not for God took him. We also find him in the walk of faith of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5. Uh, but this judgment that he speaks of is echoed throughout the Old Testament. The book of Daniel speaks of it in Daniel chapter 7 verse 10. It says a stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment and the books were open. There is going to be a reckoning one day and there is going to be a judgment. There is going to be accountability for all of the seed of Adam. We shared some of this last week as you recall. All of the seed of Adam is going to be resurrected. All of the seed of Adam is going to have to give an answer for this breath of life and this life in which we live. <coughs> <clears throat> but the the truth and the fact that Enoch here is revealing is uh, we don't have to absolutely depend upon Enoch. We find it <clears throat> in Deuteronomy 32, verse 2. We find it in Zechariah, chapter 14, verse 5. But we find this, this, this judgment for bad behavior, this judgment for deceitful acts. You know, it matters how we treat one another. Paul tells us that, uh, you know, God's not mocked for that which a man soweth, the same shall he reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, not only in this life, but also in judgment. He that soweth to the flesh shall reap life everlasting. And I really like the way he ends that in, in Galatians chapter 6. And he said, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. That's good words of encouragement for them that are doing good because we don't always see the fruit of our labors. And sometimes how we view things and how we add it up, it don't seem just. Just, But he also says, and as we have therefore the opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. It matters how God's people are treated, and God is keeping score. We don't have to keep score. God's keeping score. And the things that are done unto God's people is the same as it's being done unto God. Remember when uh, Paul was on the road to Damascus? You remember Jesus appeared to him in the way? There was a great light and a voice that said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus considered those saints that Saul was persecuting to be the same as persecuting him personally. And God takes it very personable when things are done against his people and against his children. And there is going to be a reckoning one day where all the all of the backroom deals and all the secret conversations and all of the motives of the heart are going to be laid open and they're going to be evaluated in, uh, before a holy and a righteous God and there is going to be judgments that will be handed out accordingly. You know, so nobody's going to be getting away with anything. You won't be able to pay that judge off.
and it won't matter who your daddy is or who your your good friend is. But as we uh, press on into this this text, verse fifteen, uh, there is some play on words here to execute judgment on all and to convict all of the ungodliness. The play on word here is ungodly, ungodliness, and ungodly. Really, a, you know, I could bore you with some Greek here, but this is a play on words of putting that ungodly word at the end of each sentence to put emphasis on it. Otherwise, these people ain't got a nothing to do with God. They're not listening to God. They're not, uh, they're not under assignment by God. They're basically, their God is their own belly, as, as Paul tells us in, in another place. They basically, they're, they're self-appointed, and it's all about them. It's all about them. They are their own God. They, uh, and uh, there are, are ungodly is the key word here. Otherwise, they don't have any relationship whatsoever with God. If anything, they are uh, enemies of God and against God. <coughs> These grumblers and malcontentments, you know, you remember the story of Korah and Baal? You remember we, we went through that a couple weeks back. Korah got discontent. Korah was Moses' cousin. He was a Levite. But he and his discontentment didn't cause much of a problem. What he did is he went around and he stirred up and got some other people into agreement. And all it takes is one mumbler, one person that's discontent to, it's kind of like a bad apple in the barrel <laughs> who affects other people. And uh, Jude here says these grumblers, and these grumblers and complainers, they're constantly fault-finding in everyone and everything except themselves. You know, they say, this is such human nature and the lower nature of, of, of mankind. You, you see the, uh, the speck in your brother's eye, but you don't see the beam in your own eye. But th this whole, whole uh, uh, portion of Scripture here really draws out how things are begin as first trouble within the congregation and how things spread. But these grumblers and malcontentments follow their own sinful lust. They do whatever they feel like. Their conscience has been seared with a hot iron. Uh, they, uh, they, are, they do not regard God's laws or even basic morality. Their only God is self, and they worship the God, their, their self or as their God wholeheartedly. Otherwise, my opinion is the only thing that matters. That is the attitude in which they have, and they claim to have either special knowledge or special intellect. I'm smarter than the Bible. You know, and we have seen them where people basically will say, well, you know, the Bible is archaic. It's out of time. You know, uh, we don't need the Old Testament. That Old Testament is still pregnant with prophecies that are going to come to pass. That Old Testament, God is the same Jesus of the New Testament. And you, there's, it, it was a different covenant. It was a different time, yes. But the standard of God and the character of God has never changed. What was wrong is still wrong, and what is right is still right. But they elevate their intellect as being superior over the uh, the authority of Scripture, and then it says they are loud mouth boasters. They can be eloquent speakers, but it's all about man. They do these runs. You've been around them. I have two big swelling words, big braggarts on where I've been, what I've done, <laughs> who am I? You know, and it's all about me. It's all about me. They're loud mouth braggarts. Peter says they they get. They will uh, speak great swelling words of vanity. Uh, this means they are boastful men and they are swollen with pride. They're swollen with pride. They don't talk to God's people on a level where God's people are. They talk down to them. And, and, and I'm not calling names, but we've all met these kind of people. They talk down to you. You know, they... 
they lord themselves over God's heritage. And it's kind of like the Pharisees. They, they won't enter in the door themselves, but they lay such a burden on the people that they can't enter themselves. They show favoritism for gain, uh, the gain of advantage. Otherwise, these false teachers will flatter others to get favor in return. They go after the wealthy. They go after the powerful. They basically, they treat them different than they do other people because it's what you can do for me. It's what you can do for me. Otherwise, uh, they don't treat all people equal. These false teachers use cover-ups for their real intentions, and instead of loving people, they use them and they use flattery uh, for the, as necessary to get what they want. They're deceivers. They, I, it's, it's a crude word, but they're suck-ups, <laughs> if you'll allow me to use that word. You know, they don't really genuinely love anyone but themselves, and the only time they, are, are show, par they show partiality and favoritism to certain people is because of what those people can do for me or do for them. They, they, there's not a genuine, it's not a genuine agape love in their heart that's motivating them. You know, they, uh, they're not, we look at Jesus. Jesus, as we shared, uh, was a friend of sinners. He was a friend of the poor. He was a friend of the lepers, the outcasts, the downtrodden. It didn't matter who you were or what your walk of life is. He says, I come to seek and to save that which is lost. And that God's heart needs to be our heart if we're to be uh, his representatives here in the earth. Let's keep moving here. We... Uh, we got a ways to go. All right. Says, uh, but here is the, he gets into the latter part of the text here, and, and we're, uh, this, is, this is good, safeguards against apostasy, is you must remember. You must remember. Our memory is a powerful, powerful tool. The, the things that God has shared with us, and may I say this just right here out of the gate, because we got mountaintops and we got valleys that we go through. Don't doubt in the dark what God has shown you in the light. And that is where memory comes to play. Remember what God has shown you in the light. Remember what God has shared with you. And that is the marvelous thing about the grace of God because even when we've done a piece of stupid and messed up, God has, doesn't throw us away. You know, He knew what you were going to do you know, next year when he shared that with you on that mountaintop experience. But he shared it with you anyway because he doesn't throw us away. God's in the restoration business. He is in the business of keeping us also. But as we, as we approach this text, we look back and we also look forward. It says, but remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our, our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers following after their own ungodly passions. And <coughs> it is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of spirit. And both Jesus and the apostles warned us about these false teachers and, and spiritual leaders. And the church must be prepared. The church needs to be awake. You know, the church is not a social club that we all get together and we're looking at one another instead of paying attention as to where this group's going. We all need to be awake. And the man, I'll, I'll just get plain with you here, the man in the pulpit is just as accountable to the Word of God and before God even more so than the person sitting in the pew. James 3 tells us that he would not have many be teachers because of that fact. Yes, there is a certain amount of honor that is given to the person up front, but there's also a lot more accountability. There's a lot more uh, uh, responsibility because he who is able to pass on knowledge is also able to pass on error. And I say, God, help me. God, help me to get it right because I want to be right. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> 
but let me unpack this right quick. Uh, Peter tells us in, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, he says, uh, This is the second letter I'm writing unto you, beloved. In both them I am to stir you up in your sincere mind in ways of reminder. Otherwise, don't forget, don't lose track of what God has shown you in the light in the dark time. Because you're going to get in situations where there's peer pressures. Where may, you might be the only person in the room <laughs> that's got it right. But we are to have a backbone and enough grit in our grow <laughs> to remember the truth. And I tell you what, it's, uh, it's, it's not easy. Because I'll be honest with you, there's certain things that I don't, or let me let me rephrase. I'll give you some figures. There are certain horses of theology that I refuse to ride, and uh, when I first went into the ministry, and because I didn't join the good old boys club, and didn't chime in with them, there's ministers that won't invite me to preach in their church, and some of them are my family, and it was all over the King James only issue. And I flat told him, I, no, that's, uh, I'm not going to ride that horse that has been abused. And I could tell you stories, but I'm not going to go there. But I'm just saying, there's peer pressures in the world. Just because you got out of school doesn't mean you got out from underneath peer pressures. And there's peer pressures in religious groups. But let God be true and every man be a liar. And don't doubt in the dark what God has shown you in the light. But let's, uh, let's continue forward here. The cause of division, uh, it says, and they were warned by both Jesus and the apostles. And I believe that Jude basically had heard Peter preach. Because it seems like Second Peter and Jude are a whole lot alike. So there's a lot of Peter's teaching in Jude, even though Jude's, Jesus' half-brother, and even though Jude is an evangelist traveling around, but I see a lot of uh, Peter's teachings in Jude. But they cause divisions. So these, uh, they claim to be enlightened enough and regard themselves to be superior than others in the church, but Jude condemns them as false teachers because they create division. And that is one of the, and I'll go on record here. This is one of the reasons I, 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 I've had Mormons come knock on my door, and uh, God help them. They send these young people to your door. You know, they're the missionaries. And this is one argument I put forth to the Mormon missionary when he comes. I didn't go into the deity of Christ or none of that. I'm sure that they get hit with that. But I said if Joseph Smith in the Book of Mormons was an authorized text, and that was I was gentle with them, and I said I can't accept this as an authorized che text because if Joseph Smith got a revelation from God, the Book of Mormons would agree with what the apostles taught. And he doesn't. He goes back into the Old Testament. It agrees more with an Old Testament philosophy. And then it goes down a lot of different rabbit holes. But I'm just saying, no special knowledge can disagree with the teachings of the apostles. You remember our first lesson with this? Make sure this is that. And that is the filter, that is the, uh, the standard that we must compare what we believe to. What did the apostles believe in the early church? This was the truth that Jesus gave them, and this is the truth that the Holy Spirit inspired them uh, to write and to preach. And this is the, what we compare ourselves to. Going that far back, the genuine article we hit dark times, but that was the time of the light. That was when the truth was being proclaimed. That is the truth that is, is documented. This is the truth that basically that so saved the souls of them there and will save us here today. The pure, unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ. All right. <clears throat> All right. Remember God's word. Who gave it, what they said, and, what, and why they said it. 
our next point, we're uh, going to land this plane pretty quick here. It says, but you, this is to for you to take your personal initiative. Don't be a follower. Be a follower of Christ. And as Paul said in, in Ephesians chapter 5, which is part of our Greek word of the week, it says, be ye imitators of, of, of God. Otherwise, as a child imitates God, God calls us to be imitators of him and his value and his heart. We are to have God's heart and have God's values. But you, beloved, build yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. We are to take the personal initiative here and this most holy faith is the faith that he was talking about back in verse 3 when this verse started you know contend for the faith and the faith that he's talking to was that you remember this needs to be that <laughs> that is our most holy faith the pure unadulterated gospel of jesus christ and we are to uh, uh pray in the holy spirit and this is not a spooky thing basically the only way we can pray and do it effectively is in the holy spirit because paul tells us in romans chapter 8 many times we don't even know how to pray or what to pray but the spirit basically wells up within us with groanings many times it can't be uttered it is a spirit-led prayer that teaches us how to pray and what to pray for a lot of times we don't know what to say we don't know what we need Spirit of God knows exactly what the perfect will of God is for our life, and he knows exactly where you are, and he comes and helps us with this. But here's the, the thing, keeping yourself in the love of God. Well, I thought you said God keeps us. This is keeping yourself. Which one's right? They both are. They both are. God's not going to overrun your free will, but he does the keeping but it's up to you whether you're going to walk in the love of God or not. That's your choice. You know, are you going to put your heart before the Lord each and every day and ask him to fill it with his, his love? Keeping yourself into the, in the love of God is like Teflon to our souls. Our mind, our will, and emotion, you know, Teflon stuff don't stick to it. And if you're walking in the love of God, someone offends you, and you just keep loving on God and let God love on you, that uh, just kind of just falls away. Them fairy darts that the enemy throws, you know, you know the ones. They just, they get quenched. They just fall away. The things of this world uh, become faded and dim, as the gospel song says, when we focus upon Jesus and we bathe in our walk in the love of God. The things of heaven override the things of this earth. Otherwise, the, the mud and the dirt of this world just don't stick to you when you keep yourself in the love of God. Forgiveness comes automatically. It's a gift of grace. I could tell you some stories, but we don't have time. As to the valleys that I've been through, people, uh, I mean, just, just wounds. And just keep putting it before the Lord. Keep putting it before the Lord. And the love of God washes that out of you. It's a marvelous, marvelous work of the grace of God, but you have to keep yourself in the love of God. A lot of people turn the other way and they become a root of bitterness when, when, the, uh, when life happens. People are going to disappoint you, folks. They're going to disappoint you. They're going to wound you. There's going to be uh, there's going to be things that's going to happen, and it's going to take the grace of God and the love of God to get you through it. But the, it, the love of God is like Teflon against so much and for the mercy of the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Let's get into our close here. This is believers and, their, and the sinners. And this is the attitude we need to have against the people or with the people. I shouldn't say against. But there is going to be people that you meet that have listened to the false teachers and it's becoming more and more prevalent today. I mean, it's almost like a stupor of blindness is falling across the land. And the Jude here tells us 
that uh, that we are to have mercy on those that doubt. This is the first group he speaks of, and that is that we are to have mercy on them that doubt. Don't beat them up, but to have mercy upon them, love them back into the fold. Otherwise, break their attention of that they have or uh, given unto, but they are, they have not been totally seduced by the false teachers, by the world, but they are listening. And they have begun to doubt God's truth. This second group here is saving others by snatching them out of the fire. And these are the ones of the second group here that have gone beyond doubting and they're starting to agree with the false teachers. Otherwise, they've, 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 they've decided they're going to believe some bad theology here. You know, they, they're going to they're gonna try to mix the Christian faith with a lot of this New Age stuff. You know, they got some, but it says to snatch them as out of the fire. They're, they're, uh, th we are to grab them and to pull them away before it is too late. And you may have to get a little more aggressive with these. You may have to get in someone's face, not in a hateful way, but in a loving way. So listen, you know, you may need to point some stuff out. Oh, you're judging me. No, no, we're judging fruits. We're judging fruits, and these fruits are not scriptural. These fruits are not heaven-born. And let me get into this latter part here, and this third group here. It says, Others show mercy with fear, hating even the garments that are stained by the flesh. And this third group here have gone totally into depravity because they have uh, joined the false teachers' camps. These have already joined them. These people also need mercy, but believers must be careful so as not to contaminate themselves by their sins. You know, uh, Galatians chapter 5 tells us even when someone has a moral failure that them that are more spiritual are to come alongside but to do it in the right attitude. Not in a judgmental attitude because you you don't want to. What the devil is a legalist, and if you blow yourself up and puff up, and you have the wrong attitude dealing with your brothers and sisters or with mankind, we've been called to be servants of mankind. Is we understand that we're we're not above humanity. We're a servant of humanity. But we are to come alongside and like a cast to, to fix that broken bone. That's the model that is told, uh, given to us in Galatians chapter 5. That same attitude works here, even against the false teachers. Yes, we are to uh, stand our ground, but we are not to, we hate the sin, but not the people. I guess it's the most simple way to put it. So it's uh, to be careful so as not to be contaminated by their sin. While believers might try to rescue those uh, deceived people, they must do so without allowing themselves to be contaminated by the false teachers. All right, we're going to land the plane here. The believer in the Savior, and this, I'll be honest with you, in the whole Bible, this is one of the best benedictions of them all believers in the savior it says uh, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only god and savior through jesus christ our lord be glory majesty dominion and authority before uh, all time now and forever and that pretty much covers it past present and future and th it is God who strengthens us if we'll just keep ourselves before the Lord you know just remember in the light of the word of God you have a relationship before God and it is before God there here's the thing we can't con God I can put on the mass of hypocrisy when you come to my house, I can wear that mask of hypocrisy to church and pretend to be something I'm not. But when I go to the before the Lord in prayer on bended knee, I'm transparent. I'm transparent. You can't con God. you got to be transparent and honest before God. And if you'll do business with God sincerely, wholeheartedly 
God will honor that, and he will build you up, and he will strengthen you. And God helped us to grow a backbone like a saw log. God help, uh, help us to be pure and virtuous in our faith. Not that we're better or higher than anyone else, but we want to do this right. We want to be vessels of honor in God's house. We don't want to be spotted and blemished. And God help us, God help us to be sincere in our walk. He prevents us from falling down here, and he is going to present us one day faultless up there. Amen. Glory and majesty, power and authority belong to him in the beginning, now, and forevermore. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity just to share your word. Father, we pray, Lord, that the seed of this word is be planted in the most fertile parts of our heart that we can grow strength and wisdom from, not only now, but in the days and hours to come. Help us, Father, to have good discernment and have good wisdom, Lord, that only that you can give us, Father. We place ourselves as humbly as we know how before the throne of grace, and we pray, Lord, your blessings over your people, God. Help us still just to be effective, uh, not only in your work, Lord, but be sincere in our relationship. In Jesus' name, amen.